What better way to start off Vlogmas than with a video that is about five years overdue? Better late than never, right? The topic and format of this video is not my own idea. About five years ago, my friend Victoria, who is no longer booktubing, uh, made a video called 20 Years in Reading in which she chose a book to represent every year of her life. And it wasn't a tag, but I said I wanted to do it like it was a tag. And she said, go ahead. And I made a list and I even got my parents input on it for the years of my life that I couldn't remember. And then I never filmed it and never filmed it. And I kept my notes because I kept coming back to it saying that would be a great video to make. And I'm finally doing it now. So welcome to 29 years of reading. These are the books that made me. Two notes about my reading history before I dive into the books, uh, because this might be helpful to know. The first is that I did not learn how to read until I was eight years old, which is about three or four years after most children in the US learn to read. Um, interestingly, my twin brother learned to read when he was about three or four, and he actually read things to me when I refused to learn how to read. It wasn't that I had any difficulties learning to read. I knew my alphabet, I could write my name. I just wasn't interested and I was very stubborn and contradictory and I loved being read too. I also loved writing my own stories and would just dictate them to other people to write down. But when I was about eight, my parents did sit me down and say, Rachel, you have to learn how to read. I sped through the McGuffey readers I wonder if my parents still have that set, actually. And uh, don't worry, I, I learned how to read very quickly and all of that. But it does mean that for the first about eight years of my life, the books that I've picked are not things that I read by myself for the first time. They were things that were read to me, though I did go on later to reread many of them on my own, and I have a very strong nostalgic memories about them. The second thing to know about my reading history is that I have been keeping an excruciatingly detailed list of everything I've read since I was 10 years old. When I was 10, I discovered that my mother had been keeping a list of every book that she read since her 20s, like in the 1970s or something, and I very much wanted to be like my mother, list-making, organized. I wanted to have like decades of, of reading history written down. So I started recording every book that I had uh, read, and I also had the presence of mind as a 10-year-old to sit down and write down everything that I could remember that I'd read but didn't have dates for. So pretty much my entire reading life is written down and I have dates and I can fact check and everything. So I've tried to make this list of books as chronologically accurate as possible, but there are a couple of years when I have shifted things around because of what they represent and periods of my life, or maybe when I reread something, when it had more of an impact than when I first started reading an author or a series or read a book for the first time. So with that information, let's uh, actually see what I was reading throughout my life. For age one, this is the only book that I don't have my own memory of. Obviously, I was very young, but my parents remember it. My dad can still quote probably this entire book from memory, and it is The Going to Bed book by Sondra Boynton. For age two, we have probably a favorite of my family's. This is The Two Bad Babies. It's written by Jeffy Ross Gordon and illustrated by Chris L. Demarest. I do remember this one. I remember the artwork very vividly. It is about two bad babies, a twin girl and boy, who get up to a lot of adventures by rocking and rocking their bed and rolling down the street and going places, getting treats, seeing a movie, visiting people. Um, this is one that I think my parents really liked because um, I have a twin brother, so they had, they had twin children just like in the book, and the father of the bad babies works in a bookstore and at that time in my life, my dad also worked in a bookstore. I don't know why they wanted to get rid of this. I saved this and the next one when they were culling their book collection. How could you get rid of such a perfect book? For age three, we have Piggies by Audrey and Don Wood. I also remember this one. I have fond memories of this as a child and thinking it was hilarious, probably because of the way that my dad read it or something. Um, However, looking at it now, I think it's terrifying. 
Probably because as an adult I have developed a little bit of a, not fear, but I get the creepy crawlies from disembodied hands and this whole thing is disembodied hands with piggies dancing on them. But I sure loved it as a kid. For age four, we have Mike Mulligan and His Steam Shovel by Virginia Lee Burton. This is such a famous children's book. I'm sure many people know about this one. Um, I think I was very attached to it because it's all about that relationship between a man and his machine and they have a happy ending and they get to be together. And when I originally made this list years ago, I actually went to the library and I got this book again and reread it and I still really liked it. It was still really good. For age five, Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery. Apparently my mother read this to me first, though I don't actually remember that. I ended up having to read it on my own for a school assignment and I loved it. I loved the entire series actually. I, I loved the books. I was heartbroken by a couple of them. Um, though I think that the first one, Anne of Green Gables, is still probably the best. For age six, Betsy Tacey, or Betsy Tacey and Tib, which is the second book in the series by Maud Hart Lovelace. I think there are seven or eight of these books. I own them, but they're packed away in a keepsake box in my basement. I'm not gonna go unpack them for this. Um, but I love these books. I believe my mother read me the first four or five of them. Um, the series kind of ranges from little children's stories up to almost young adult novels as the main character, Betsy, gets older. So my mother read the first couple of them to me when I was roughly the same age as the little girls in the story. Betsy, Tacy, and Tib, and I love them. The adventures the girls get up to, I remember rolling on the floor laughing so hard. It was just amazing. And then I did eventually finish the series on my own when I became older and could read on my own. And I have very fond memories of these. I reread the first one a couple years ago um, for a rereadathon, I think, and I still really enjoyed it. Though I was surprised at how dated they seem. I'm pretty sure the books were written in the 1940s and they were set a couple decades earlier in the Edwardian period. And you can really see that in the illustrations in the stories. But I know as a child, I had no concept of time or historical eras like that. It didn't really matter. For age seven, we have Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder, kind of a stand-in for the entire series. I think the first book is actually Little House in the Big Woods, but this is the one that I remember being read to me. Um, my mother read most of the series to me, and I honestly can't remember if I ever read them again on my own. I should have checked that, but I, I honestly remember this series as something I shared with my mother more than anything else. I swear I'm coming to the end of the books that were read to me first, but we still have a couple of years to go. For age eight, I'm just gonna stick like the original Redwall books by Brian Jakes in here. Redwall is a children's fantasy series where all the characters are like mice and rats and voles and moles and weasels and things like that. Um, and I loved them. My dad read aloud many of the first books in the series uh, to my family and it was an experience. I still remember the Scottish accent he did for the moles and I remember all the descriptions of food. I know Oh, there is an actual red wall cookbook out there somewhere <laughs> and I've always meant to take a look at it. Some of the original books that I definitely remember and that I own copies of are Martin the Warrior, uh, Matameo, and Salamandastron, and somewhere I have a copy of The Pearls of Lutra, which is my personal favorite in the series. Now at age nine, I had learned to read and I was reading things on my own, but I had to choose The Lord of the Rings for this year because my dad read it aloud that year. It was my first introduction to Tolkien's work, so I can't remember if I had experienced The Hobbit before then, but I'm pretty sure that given that it was 1999, I think that the Peter Jackson movies had been announced in development. My parents were very excited. They are big Lord of the Rings fans and decided to share it with their children. And I loved it. And then I went on to read the books on my own for the first time when I was 11 and I think I've read them twice more since then. I should do that again. I love these so much. For age 10, we are moving into recorded history, when my spreadsheets are of use and I can start fact-checking things. 
Interestingly, I would have sworn that the first book I ever read by Diana Wynne Jones was A Tale of Time City. I vividly remember coming across that book in the library, taking it off the shelf, and starting to read it there in the library. I loved that book. But it turns out, the first book I probably ever read by Jones was when I was 10, not 11 or 12, and it was probably Castle in the Air, which I don't know why I would have read this one first. It's a sequel to Howl's Moving Castle, and I hadn't read Howl's Moving Castle at that point. I don't remember anything about it. But this was a momentous occasion for me because Jones is probably my single most favorite childhood author. Still one of my favorite authors today. She wrote amazing fantasy stories for children and also good for adults. They're the kind of stories that are intelligent and work on multiple levels for both kids and adults, pretty much anyone of any age. And I love reading them as an adult as well, which means I should probably reread this book and find out what it was actually about. <laughs> Now we are getting on to books that I am just so excited about because they are ones I vividly remember that I can point to and say these things shaped me as a reader, in some cases shaped me as a person, and many of them I have reread as an adult and found them to be just as good and just as important to me. For age 11 I just have one book, but it is a very very important book for me and that is So You Want to Be a Wizard by Diane Duane. This is the first in the Young Wizard series which begins as middle grade and as the characters get older it becomes more of a young adult series. I have reread all of these books a couple of years ago and I did a series overview of it, so I will try to link that video for you if you want to know more. But one of the things I've always loved the most about this series, which is very telling about my personality probably, is that the magic and the science are pretty much the same thing. The magic system functions in a very scientific and mathematical way, and all of the wizards are essentially tasked with this great mission of saving the universe from entropy, which is not actually possible, but trying to, that's a good story. I'm pretty sure that my reading absolutely exploded when I was 12 years old, both in volume but also in variety, and I had to choose three different books for this age because there was no way I could leave any of these three out and just choose one. They're all really important because of either discovering a particular book or a particular author or just an, an experience of the time. So the first one is kind of the obligatory Harry Potter mention. I read the first three Harry Potter books when I was 12, and I can't actually say that Harry Potter has been hugely influential in my reading life, in my taste, in what I enjoy reading, but at the time that the books were coming out, it was an experience, this, this very exciting shared experience with so many people, including my family. And that's what I remember the most about these books is that yes, they are good. The original seven books are the only thing I have ever cared about for Harry Potter and I think they are all great. I don't care about anything else beyond that. And so at the time they were really, really important because of that shared experience. This is also the year that I read The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin for the first time. Now, this is not the first book that I ever read by Le Guin, and I'd actually had her um, Cat Wings books read to me as a child, and I loved those. I loved cats and the idea of cats with wings. My inner four-year-old is just crying with excitement about that. Um, but yes, when I was 12, I started picking up um, Ursula Le Guin's adult novels. Some of them I wasn't old enough for. I read The Dispossessed at the same age and did not understand it and didn't enjoy it very much because I didn't understand it. It was far too adult for me. It was far too abstract and political as well. But The Left Hand of Darkness, despite the fact that I was a very naive, innocent 12-year-old who had no idea about sexuality or gender or any of those things, this struck a chord in me. And I remember reading it and thinking, 
this is a very important moment in my life. <laughs> this is a book I will come back to. And after that point, I went off and I read everything I could get my hands on by Le Guin. So this was absolutely a turning point in my reading life. And then I think it was the first time when I kind of reflected on my own reading and that what I was reading could affect me and what I would go on to read in the future. And the last book for this year is Wild Magic by Tamara Pierce. This is the first novel I ever read by Tamara Pierce. When I was 12, my mother, who was a professional librarian, went to a library conference where Tamara Pierce was a guest of honor, I believe. And my mother was like, hmm, Rachel might like these books. So she got me the first two books in the Immortals Quartet. They are signed and personalized by Tamara Pierce. Um, she brought them home to me. I read them and thus began my love affair with everything by Tamara Pierce. Uh, she went on to become one of my absolute favorite authors ever. She's still one of my autobi authors. And The Immortals Quartet, and especially Wild Magic, while not her best novel, will always be my favorite. At age 13, I was massively in love with the Amelia Peabody mystery series by Elizabeth Peters. And so for this year, the only book I could really choose was Crocodile on the Sandbank, which is the first in that series. This is one of two historical mystery series that my mother recommended to me that I devoured and loved so much. The second one was Brother Cadfile, which I never found a good place to put any of those books on this list, unfortunately, but I had to mention Amelia Peabody for this, this age because it was such a thing. It was such a thing, guys. I mean, I think I still have a crush on Ramses. Um, I am not one to really feel that way about fictional characters at all. But in my entire life, the only fictional crushes that I have had that are still enduring to this day would be Ramses, who's the son of Amelia Peabody in the series, and uh, Eugenides from a book that I will be talking about very soon. Good times, guys. Unfortunately, I do understand that there are some really problematic elements in the early books in the Amelia Peabody novels. I mean, it's essentially about a white English lady who goes to dig up artifacts in Egypt in the Victorian Edwardian era, and the character or the characters in general don't really confront the prejudices, the racism, the colonialism, just all of that until much later in the series, and probably not to a satisfactory degree for many people now. I have friends who have tried to read the series and bounced off of it because of those things, and I can completely understand why, but also sometimes we just love what we love. <laughs> At age 14, I had discovered Terry Pratchett as something completely different grammar. So my favorite books from this year are Going Postal, which is my favorite Discworld novel ever, hands down, will never convince me otherwise, and Eats, Shoots, and Leaves by Lynn Truss, which is hilarious if you are very serious about grammar and punctuation and are very irritated when other people get it wrong. At 15 years old, I had entered into my brief but intense affair with manga. I'm pretty sure that my brother and I were bankrolling Tokyo Pop with all the allowance money we were shoving at them. Though I don't think Tokyo Pop is even around anymore. They're they're gone, right? I was reading things like 20, 30 volumes of Initial D at this point, which, yeah, it's a straight racing manga, but I was really into it. But the uh, series I had to choose for this year, which is symbolic of all of that, but also my favorite manga series ever, is Fruits Basket. No surprise. So this is a series by Natsuki Takaya. There are 23 volumes of it. I actually started reading it when I was 13 or 14, but it was around age 15 that um, I kind of caught up with the English translations and I was so invested. This is the only time prior to BookTube actually that I became involved in an online community. 
and I was reading scanlations online, don't tell anybody, um, and just really, really into it. And I was learning about all the shocking developments in the series as they were being published in Japan, and it was it was great. I have also reread Fruits Basket last year, in fact, so not that long ago, and I thought it was just as good as when I read it for the first time, if not better. I really admired the storytelling and how it was all handled. It's a really good, intense, and emotional series. And for age 16, I was going to tell you about that other fictional crush, right? That would be Eugenides from The Thief by Megan Whalen Turner. Talk about heartbreak, guys. If you have read this series, you know what happens in book two. This is book one. I read the second book first, guys. I did not realize the second book was a sequel. I did not realize it was part of a series. So I read it and this thing happens to Jen. And then I found out it was the second book and I had to go back and read the first book. And I'm still upset about this. Can you tell? I love this book. I will never forgive the second book for breaking my heart before I even read the first book. I just can't, but I have I have reread this book multiple times. It is such a favorite of mine. I love Eugenides, and I have always been sad that as the series progresses, Jen isn't a main character and he's not a point of view character anymore. And I want him back so much. I think I'll just have to reread this book now. <laughs> At age 17, my reading had drastically decreased because I was in the middle of university. So it's not really surprising that over the next couple of years, I read very little that wasn't for school, and most of my favorites or defining moments in my reading were things I had to read for school. For age 17, at least, it was a funny thing, and that is Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. I read Hamlet first. I also read it in university, but um, as much as I liked Hamlet, Much Ado About Nothing was the moment I had that epiphany that I could enjoy old plays, that I could enjoy Shakespeare's language, and that it could actually make me laugh. It may be my favorite Shakespeare play. These were also the years when I was working my first job in a library. At age 18, I read The Air Affair by Jasper Ford, the first book in the Thursday Next series. I read these books because a coworker of mine at the library recommended them. She was obsessed with Jasper Ford's books, and I binged the entire Thursday Next series and loved them. They were actually one of the few things I read at all when I was 18. <laughs> At age 19, I'm gonna stick in Dead Until Dark by Charlene Harris, which is the first book in the Sookie Stackhouse series. I started reading this series years before, but when I was 19, pretty much the only things I read were rereads of favorites, including this series, and it's pretty much the height as well as the end of my interest in the Sookie Stackhouse series and with Charlene Harris in general as an author. It was all downhill from here, unfortunately. <laughs> When I was 20 years old and in my senior year of university, a friend of mine in school uh, came in one day when we were working and said, Rachel, have you heard about this book? It's so good. You might really like this. So I sat down and I read some of it and I borrowed the book and I read half of it and I was so into it, but I had to return the book. So I bought my own copy and pre-ordered like the next two. And that book was Soulless by Gail Carriger. Thank you, Carragher, for entering my life right at the moment when I most needed some comic relief and just fun shenanigans. <laughs> At age 21, I started writing my master's thesis, and I spent an entire summer pretty much just reading things for that. So the book that encapsulates that entire year for me is Designing Web Navigation by James Kalbach. I mean, I really loved this book. It was hot reading material for me at the time, but also over the next two years, I became incredibly sick of it. Because, like, master's thesis, guys. At age 22, I was almost out of grad school. I was working full time in my field, and I had a brief moment of pure ecstasy one afternoon when I read this entire book at work, and thought my head would explode, and that is The Elements of Content Strategy by Aaron Kassane.
I am not actually a content strategist, but damn, that would be fun. At 23, I was out of grad school. I had so much free time all of a sudden. I devoted myself to getting back into reading and catching up with all of the authors and series that I hadn't read in about seven years. And I realized that I was no longer interested in basically reading young adult fantasy science fiction anymore. So I challenged myself to start reading all of the best novel winners of the Hugo and Nebula Awards, which is a project that I actually finished. I completed it on this channel a couple of years ago. And uh, so when I started off uh, with that project, it did lead me to discovering some of my favorite authors today. So hands down, the book that represents this year for me is Shards of Honor by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is kind of the best starting place for the Vorkosigan saga, in my opinion. I had actually read maybe three other books by Bujold before I got to this one. I read The Curse of Chalion and Paladin of Souls, which are amazing fantasy, and I had read Falling Free, which is chronologically the first book set in the Vorkosigan saga. But I think the story proper really starts in Shards of Honor. I loved this book, I love this author, and I loved the entire series. Age 24 was not a happy time. Let's say that 2014 was my hell year, and amidst all of the sad, depressing, scary, and anxiety-inducing things that happened that year, I was pretty much self-medicating with reading, watching lots of booktube, because I discovered booktube in early 2014, and book shopping, which was cheap therapy at the time, though don't worry, I paid for actual therapy. Uh, and amidst all of those not fun things happening, there are two books that are really important to me from this year, out of, out of so many things that I was reading, so many things that I love from that year. The first one is Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie. Would you believe that I did not think I was going to enjoy this book at all? I was voting in the Hugo Awards for the first time that year, and this was nominated, so I was gonna make myself read it. I just was looking at the cover of it thinking, mm, that's not really my thing, is it? And then I loved it. It's one of my favorite books ever, probably, and I still need to reread it. And then a little bit more melancholy because of, of just the circumstances in which I read it, but probably the single most important thing I read that entire year is Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. Now I'm not gonna get into the actual circumstances of why that one means so much to me, but part of why I remember it so much is that I was reading stories from this on my way to have hip surgery at like 6 a.m. in the morning. It was not a fun time. Um, but because of some of the stories in this, it struck a nerve for me with all the things that had happened that year. And then I'm pretty sure that Ted Chang single-handedly taught me that I could enjoy short fiction. He's a master writer of short stories, of novelettes, of novellas. I love his work so much, and I read it, I think, when I needed to. At this point, all the books I'm going to mention I have read since starting my channel, and I have reviewed them or talked about them in a wrap-up somewhere, so I will not talk about them as much. For age 25, the single book from that year that I have to point out is Anathem by Neil Stevenson, or, or however you pronounce that. I think that he pronounces it Anathem. I can't get my tongue around that for some reason. Um, this is probably my favorite book by Neil Stevenson. I really, really loved Seven Neves as well, but Anathem was when I knew I could really, really enjoy these super chunky science fiction novels from Stevenson, and everything about this worked for me. At age 26, I have a stack of books. All five of these are ones I simply couldn't choose between them. I realized that all five of these were extremely indicative of my taste in science fiction and in nonfiction. These are all books I can point to and say, reading this helped define to me what I enjoy reading. So very quickly here, we have After Atlas by Emma Newman, The Gene and Intimate History by Siddhartha Mukherjee, Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson, 
Slow River by Nicola Griffith. I still think that my review of this book is one of the single best videos I have ever made. <laughs> and To Like the Lightning by Ada Palmer. At age 27, we have another three books that I think are highly indicative of my taste in science fiction and that I adored reading. All three of these were so, so fun to read. The first is Orbital Cloud by Taiyo Fuji. The second is Raven Stratagem by Yoon Ha Lee because I could just read endlessly about Mikadez. And third, with everybody's favorite antisocial security unit, we have All Systems Read by Martha Wells. And then we come to the last two years, which were astonishingly easy to pick books for. For age 28, that would be 2018. No one is surprised. It's The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal. I read a lot of good books last year, but this is the one. It's, it's the only one I could pick for age 28. And what about this year? I mean, this year isn't over yet. We've got another month or so to go. That's maybe another... 40, 50 books I could read, but I think I have to call it possible mild spoilers for my favorite books of the year list, but number one has to be A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martine. This is such a me book. I'm still trying to get my breath back. That was a lot of talking. This is such an absurdly long video. You can't see it right now, but I am surrounded by this scattering of like 40 books on the floor and I've got to reshelve all of these today as well. Like, wow. Um, and that, that is the summary of the highlights of my entire reading life, which is also my entire life. So there you go. If any of these books are ones that you have read as well, if they were special to you as well, let me know in the comments down below. Let's talk about our reading histories. And I will be back very soon, tomorrow, with another video for Vlogmas. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, bye.